today my sermon is simply entitled Paul Knows and our texts are going to be uh, 2 Timothy 1.12, Romans 8.28, and 2 Corinthians 5.1. And as we go through our lives on a daily basis, uh, we're often confronted by people who know more than we do about any number of things. I'm just kind of learning about farming and ranching and that kind of stuff. And I'll be the first to admit I know virtually nothing about it. And uh, that's the way it is with many of us. There's always someone who knows more than we do about farming, science, mechanics, math, whatever. And that's just the way it is. Everybody has their own part to play in the world. But this also brings turmoil into many of our lives because many of us are not sure of our relationship with God or Jesus or if we are going to heaven or to hell. We just simply, many of us, don't know. <clears throat> But in 1895, a uh, New York preacher happened to preach a sermon about the fast-paced living in his day. It seemed like every preacher in his day, there's something to preach about. But uh, this preacher, he spoke about bicycles and, and how the speed was not good for us and that it was going to produce a generation of nervous and high strung <coughs> creatures. And not too much longer after that, cars ran 15 miles an hour, and doctors were afraid for our lives that it was going to cause heart failure at this tremendous speed that the body's not used to going. Well, you know, today we've got cars that right off of the parking lot will go well over 100 miles an hour, some will even go over 200 miles an hour. And a lot of us don't think anything about driving them that fast, unfortunately. But the man who preached in 1895 was right about one thing. We do tend to live our lives at a very rapid pace. And it increases with every generation. And life for us seems to be a question of how fast we can get something done or get someplace quickly so we can do it again. Uh, we as a, a people tend to be nervous, anxious, and restless and always in a hurry to do something else. And doctors will tell us today that there's more mental suffering in the world than ever before, uh, even though we're a population that is concerned with physical health. And uh, if you ever walk the city's streets, you can find many people who have this look of anxiety or worry on their face as they're scurrying around here and there within the cities. But even with this anxiety, there's something worse today that we're faced with. And many people are afflicted with terrible spiritual unrest. We have all sorts of isms and cults today. And uh, men and women are often seeking some kind of a solace to try and satisfy the spiritual unrest that lies within their heart. And they're turning to any man who cries out and says, I have found it. I have all the answers to your troubles. Well, unfortunately, these people normally don't know any more about solving your spiritual unrest than you do. Why people will listen to someone who knows nothing more than they do, I don't know. But the problem is that these so-called religions 
or cults or whatever you want to call them are not founded upon the spiritual principles of God or His Word. They just are founded upon whatever man wants to make of them. And because of this, they're unable to satisfy the human heart and its quest for spiritual solace. But I know where man is able to find the spiritual solace that he needs where his heart can find rest and peace and where he can experience true satisfaction in his life. One can only find this life within the existence of the personage of Jesus. That's it. Nowhere else. He and He alone satisfies the needs of the world within that existence. There's no guru, no cult leader, no scientist, or no human that is able to do what Jesus is able to do, and that is satisfy your spiritual desires. He is the only place you can go to get that done. Now there's an old hymn, some of you may know, well, probably a lot of us don't, but it's called, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, uh, by Horatius Benar in the 1800s. And the first verse says this, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down thy weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Jesus gives you something to hold on to in our world of fleeting fancies. While others doubt and say, I just don't know. The believer within Jesus' kingdom can say, I know. Paul, the apostle, said it long ago, and you can also say it today. The man who follows Jesus, our Messiah, has an anchor, one that holds safe and secure. You're not going to be drifting with every wind of doctrine out there. Jesus' faith is what lifts us above all the unrest the world has to offer and allows us to trust within His existence. We're not looking out at it. We are existing within Him. Paul said this, I know on three different occasions. And let's take a look at these three different occasions. Now the first one is in 2 Timothy 1.12 and it says, For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. It says, For I know whom. We as a people generally pass by any man who says he guesses and we tend to listen to the man who knows. When you're sick, you don't go to listen to someone who doesn't know anything about your illness. But you want a man who has the ability to heal you. Now, Paul is one of the greatest believers in our text that we read. And it says, I know. Therefore, if he claims to know, maybe we need to stop and listen and try to figure out what it is that he knows. Paul had a great experience 
more than one as a believer. <coughs> Jesus had spoken with him personally. He had walked with him in Jesus' existence. He had been filled with God's Spirit. He knew what he was speaking about because he had experiential knowledge of Jesus. He had experienced Him and the direct impact in His life. Now often, people make a mistake in quoting this verse. And they say, I know in whom I have believed. Well, that's not right. It doesn't say that. The verse says, I know whom I have believed. And the whom is Jesus. This has been said before, but it's very good. You need to hear it again. I don't want a preposition to come between me and the Lord. Okay? If you had really <coughs> truly been born again, born from the Spirit, you can say, I know Jesus and not, I know about Jesus. There's been a lot of people who knew a lot about Jesus and went straight to hell because they did not know Jesus personally. The believer knows experientially a person who has the name Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, one who actually came into his being and changed that very being from something dead to something alive. Changed his nature from dead within the destructive existence of sin to alive within the creative existence of Jesus. We believers know the one who forgives our sins, the one who walks with us and talks with us and blesses us. Now, you may guess many things. And when you guess, you have a 50-50 chance of being right. But a lot of times your choice may not cause you any harm. Am I going to eat a serving of mashed potatoes or a, a serving of french fries? You flip a coin and you got a 50% chance of coming out with the one you want to eat. But this is not so with God. If you guess wrongly about your choice, you die. Now, you may not understand all of the ins and outs of the Bible. No one is going to. Not a person. But you can say for sure, I know because you've met Him face to face and fell in love with Him, and you can truly say, I am His beloved, and He is mine. And in the, the Hebrew, it says, Ani ladodi ladodi li. And many people in Israel will have this on their wedding rings. I am His beloved, and He is mine. That's from the Song of Solomon. Mr. Sir James Simpson, who discovered the usage of chloroform back in the 1800s, when asked what his greatest discovery was, replied, My greatest discovery was when I learned that I was a sinner and took Jesus Christ as my Savior. And isn't that the way we should all be? Everyone can know Jesus. Everyone has the ability to have this wonderful salvation experience. When you want to meet a man, what do you do? 
You just stare at him until he comes over to you? No. You go up to him and you say, Hello, I'd like to meet you. Do you want to meet Jesus, your Savior? And now is the time to come to Him. Today is the time to come and lay all of your burdens at your feet, or at His feet. And today is the time to trust Him with all of your heart. And it's not given to all of us to know all of the great kings and of the earth, or all the great scientists, or the scholars, or this one or that one, but everyone can know Jesus. I can know about the Queen of England because I see her on the TV. I can't know her personally. But I can know Jesus. And everyone here can know Jesus. The whole world can know Jesus because He makes Himself available to the whole world. And there's a story that a rich nobleman walked out of his palace one cold day and met a beggar who was cold and hungry. And the man reached in his pocket to get a coin and he found his pockets empty. And so he said to the beggar, I am sorry, my brother, but I have nothing to give you this morning. And about an hour later, when the nobleman returned, the beggar said to him, Thank you, sir. And the nobleman was kind of startled, and he said, Well, why do you thank me? I, I did nothing for you. And he said, Yes, the beggar, you called me brother, and that alone brightened my whole day. And we have to understand that Jesus does much more than that for each and every one of us. He calls us brothers and sisters and gives to us the true riches of both the heaven and the earth. Do your sins overcome you? Do the burdens of life lay you down? Do doubts fill your heart? Then now's the time to turn your life to God. Turn your life over to God but do it on His terms. The problem with most of the world is we try to make God obey us on our terms. Believe and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you can truly say with Paul, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The second point I'd like to talk about, where Paul mentions I know, is Romans 8.28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to His purpose. Here again, Paul speaks about his experience with Jesus. He's been beaten, placed in prison, persecuted, and been shipwrecked. But he was able to say, it has all worked together for my good. At another time, he was able to say, all of this has turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Because it doesn't matter what we have to endure if the end result brings glory to God, blessings to someone else, and results in the salvation of others. The creation of more life within Jesus. That's why we're here in the first place. And it often seems to us that this text is true when we look at it from earthly eyes. Hardships and trouble come to us and we say, well, this can't be good. I'm suffering too much. 
must be something wrong with my faith. The hardship is too much for me to bear. But you know, as the years pass and God works out His purposes, one day we can say that was the best thing that ever happened to me. The text doesn't say that all things are good. But it says God takes everything that we deem bad and works them out for the benefit of we who are existing within His kingdom. And that's the key. If we're existing with God and in His kingdom, then ultimately everything will work towards God's ends within the kingdom. You know, for many of us, it must be a sin for us to always be worrying, as most of us do. Jesus said, be not anxious. But we as a people tend to disobey that commandment and worry about everything until we're sick and in bed, dying with whatever. But God has promised to look after us if we attend to His interests. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. It's Matthew 6.33. The psalmist wrote out of experience when he said, I have been young, but now am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalms 37.25 So when trouble comes, when it seems the whole world is against you, you remember this, that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Okay? The third time Paul mentions that he knows is in 2 Corinthians 5, 1. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Isn't this a wonderful passage of Scripture? Every day our bodies are decaying. We're getting older and weaker. But Paul says to us that it is all right. Just rest in the fact that when our body is gone, God will give us a better one. In fact, He will make us a body that is eternal in the heavens. And you know, Paul never speculated about eternal life at all. He said that for him, it would be better to depart and be with Jesus. Yet he cheerfully remained on this earth and in this earthly realm and went about his work. But he knew that one day his head would be placed upon the block, the axe would come down, and his head would be severed. Yet he also knew that despite all the evil against him, his eternal soul, the real Paul, would go on living and would soar up to heaven to be with God in his glory. If you remember the story of Moses, one day Moses was taken up on the mountain, crossed the Jordan, and God showed him all the beauties of the promised land. But God had to say to him that he wasn't allowed to, to go over there and enter into the promised land. And I'm sure that tears probably flowed down his cheek that he wasn't able to get over there to put a foot on the promised land. But, 
I'm sure God comforted him and blessed him because he took him home to the home he had prepared for him up in heaven. You have to remember, our homes are already prepared for us in heaven if we will just submit to the will of God and Jesus. Let me give you an example. You know pigeons are sometimes thought of as great birds. Depends on if you're in the city and they're, they're doing their business. But pigeons are very unique birds. The homing pigeons, there's something about them that God has blessed them with the ability to come home. It's something innate in those birds. And we don't really understand how that works. Scientists speculate it has something to do with magnetic fields or the sun or whatever. But the bird finds its way home almost every time. God has placed within those birds this innate ability. And at the same time, God has placed within us this innate nature if we just allow it to operate. This homing instinct within each of our souls is there because God's put it there. We long for something beyond this earthly life and the sorrows that we see surrounding us. God in His love and His mercy have provided eternal blessings to us all who accept Jesus as their Savior. And it doesn't matter if you're the most wealthy person on earth or the poorest person on earth. You have access to the exact same blessings from God. Now someday our earthly houses will crumble and decay and our school of life will be over. And our troubles will be done. But God will open His door into heaven and welcome us into our, earthly, our heavenly home. And we will forever exist with God. We can therefore say with surety along with Paul, I know, I know, I know that God is caring for me and that He has a home prepared for me when I die. Because God takes care of our past, our present, and our future. Have you ever thought about this? God's name, Yudhe represents the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. God forgives us of our past, allows us to exist with Him in the present, and takes us to Him in the future. Just as God exists within this realm of three time periods, if you will, we have to allow God to be God and ruler over all of our three realms of existence. God has to be in control of those three realms of existence, our past, our present, and our future. He forgives our past sins, provides for our present needs, and He prepares us a place in glory for our future. And this alone should be enough that every believer should want to stand and shout for joy. And friends, I can't describe fully to you all the glories of God. No man is going to be able to do that. But one day, 
our earthly scales will fall off and we'll be able to see the glories of God without measure that have been laid before us and we will dwell within all of that glory. But today, we can experience a sample of what it shall be like within the kingdom of Jesus upon the earth. It was created to be an earthly existence within the kingdom of God, and it was created just for those of us who are believers and trying to exist within Jesus' existence. That's what the kingdom is all about, enabling us to have an earthly contact with that heavenly spiritual existence. Now, if you desire the best that life has to offer, wouldn't you want to exist forgiven and transform from death unto life? Don't you want peace and joy to shine forth from you to all those around you so that they too can be drawn into the forgiving and saving power of Jesus? I want everybody around me to be saved and experience joy. But this is the life that is yours if you just submit to God. Give your heart to Jesus and begin to exist within His kingdom. And it's available to us all. All we have to do is ask. Is there anybody here today that wants more of Jesus' kingdom? Who wants to experience all that God has to offer? All you have to do is just simply say, Here I am, Lord. Use me. That's what I want. Is there anybody here who needs prayer specifically for something? Maybe just a prayer for the Lord to reveal Himself to you in a greater way. To manifest through you. that life, all you have to do is say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Use me in the kingdom. And then expect, <laughs> earnestly expect, that God's going to do that. And send people to you. And use you in a greater way within this kingdom.